Hello, my name is Lisa Fagan Davis and I'm the executive director of the Medieval Academy of America. I'm here to speak to you about old books, new technologies, medieval manuscript fragments and IIIF. Medieval manuscripts undertake long and difficult journeys to get from there and then to here and now. Fragmentology concerns itself with the study of manuscripts that have only barely survived the journey, arriving in pieces. Fragmentologists like myself interrogate when and how and why a codex was fragmented, investigate the contents and history of a given fragment or set of fragments, and may even work to rebuild the fragmented codex in the digital realm. By leveraging the international image interoperability framework in these efforts, Curators, catalogers, students, and scholars are able to avoid siloing images, simplify data modeling, embrace digital sustainability, and create open access discoverable digital objects with part and whole level metadata. IIIF viewers incorporate features that can facilitate user engagement with images in powerful ways. As always, however, the first step is thorough cataloging to enable discoverability. Although it is critically important for a cataloger to attempt to identify the text preserved on a particular fragment, as well as determining its approximate date and place of origin, the physical characteristics of a fragment must be considered as well, as these features can tell a cataloger much about the fragment's history. This is because the fragmentation of manuscripts is directly related to trends in book production, collecting, and marketing that can be associated with particular eras. Throughout the late Middle Ages and early modern era, resourceful bookbinders used pieces of earlier manuscripts as binding structures, covers, fly leaves, binding stays, and spine liners. The binders were utilizing existing resources by recycling old parchment instead of killing and skinning a perfectly good animal to make new parchment. Often they would dismantle a book that was out of date or damaged, but there were other reasons why manuscripts might be dismembered. The Protestant Reformation in England, for example, saw a deliberate destruction of monastic manuscripts, which led in turn to a lively 16th century market in manuscript waste. Binders used such fragments to cover the boards or hold the leather turn ends in place or they might have more supportive functions, such as reinforcing the sewing in the middle of a gathering, serving as a layer of protection between the sewing bands and the leather covering the spine, or functioning as hinged, prefatory, or concluding fly leaves. Fragments that have been removed from their host bindings bear the scars of that early reuse, scars that can themselves be interpreted as evidence of origin and provenance. The next phase of fragmentation begins in the 18th century, as manuscripts begin to be cut up, quote, for pleasure and profit, unquote, in the words of Christopher de Hamel, instead of for practical purposes. Throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, collectible illuminated initials and miniatures were cut out close to the borders, the remnant text often discarded. This practice resulted in sales and collections of freestanding, tightly cropped initials, arranged cuttings, and elaborate collages. Many collectors were more interested in the art than the text, and dealers and owners alike developed a habit of cutting out initials and miniatures, leaving behind spoliated carcasses. For example, the series of choir books created for the use of Pope Clement VII was looted from the Sistine Chapel in 1798, and Luigi Cialotti has been held responsible for their desecration by cutting in the early 19th century. Elaborate collages such as that preserved at Harvard University's Houghton Library were the result. The rise of capitalist antiquarianism in the late 19th and early 20th centuries impacted the rare book and manuscript trade in ways that would have long-term implications for the selling and buying of manuscript fragments, especially in North America. In addition to trimmed cuttings and albums of binding fragments or miniatures, whole single leaves begin to appear on the market with increasing frequency. Booksellers such as Otto Eggy and Philip Duchnez realized that they would make a lot more money if they broke manuscripts apart, selling 250 leaves to 250 buyers instead of one book to one buyer. What dealers broke, collectors bought. 
The United States, with its new industry-fueled wealth, was a primary beneficiary of this flooded market. Today, there are tens of thousands of leaves from thousands of tragically dismembered manuscripts in hundreds of North American collections. In many cases, these holdings represent a coherent and intrinsically American corpus of leaves that can be affiliated with a discrete number of manuscripts, leading to the realistic possibility of the recovery and study of at least a portion of many of these codices. The leaves of such dismembered manuscripts are so scattered, however, that it is essentially impossible to physically reunite them in the haptic world. Digital imaging and interoperability, combined with effective cataloging and discoverability, offer a way forward. The development of the International Image Interoperability Framework, or IIIF, in the 2010s signaled the beginning of the next phase of the study of medieval fra manuscript fragments, digital fragmentology. The International Image Interoperability Framework is a way of serving digital images so that they can be manifested within a IIIF compliant viewer, such as Mirador, Open Sea Dragon, or the Universal Viewer. IIIF compliant image files can be shared via a persistent URL instead of by downloading and uploading into a silo. The underlying code, the manifest, includes metadata that travels with the image, metadata that can be updated and expanded by the holding institution at any time. If an online image is IIIF compliant, it can be manifested in a workspace known as a shared canvas simply by pointing to the IIIF manifest URL. The image file and the associated metadata encoded in the manifest are drawn into the shared canvas when called for, rather than being physically stored there. This interoperability has the advantage of enabling a user to apply annotations and sequence images without transforming the um, image files or the data. An image can be stored in one place, while being used in multiple workspaces. The model is completely open access and avoids siloing and is thus in keeping with digital best practices. Three case studies will demonstrate how IIIF facilitates the study of manuscript fragments. First, let's examine a collection of miniatures cut from a late 15th century copy of the Grand Chronique de France, preserved in an album at the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. In the early 19th century, each of the miniatures was cut from its parent manuscript and mounted suspended within a square opening in a sheet of paper so that the text on the other side can be read. Generally speaking, when miniatures like this have been cut from a manuscript, it's extremely difficult to identify the parent codex from which they were removed as these spoliated carcasses were often discarded. In this case, however, the parent manuscript was preserved and is now manuscript five in the collection of the Chateauroux Municipal Library, about 170 miles south of Paris. 13 miniatures have been cut out of this manuscript and the 11 miniatures in Paris just happen to fill 11 of these holes. The other two miniatures are still missing. As it is exceedingly unlikely that Paris will send the miniatures to Chateauroux or that Chateauroux will send the codex to Paris, we need to find a way to restore the miniatures to the codex without actually relocating them. Using the power of IIIF service, we can in fact digitally restore the miniatures to the manuscript as in this demo created by um, the brilliant minds at Biblissima. By editing the underlying code in the IIIF JSON, we can tell the server how to crop the image of the miniature to remove the paper frame and where on the target canvas it should appear using the viewer's layering feature. Then we can toggle the miniatures and watch as they're digitally restored to their original home. And this can all be accomplished without transforming or copying the image files and without rekeying any metadata. My second example demonstrates how annotation in a IIIF compliant space can facilitate deeper analyses of images and objects. Let's revisit the Chalotti collage at Harvard's Home Library, manuscript TYP 734. With the naked eye, it is extremely difficult to discern how many puzzle pieces make up TYP 734. By zooming in on the high resolution digital image on the Houghton website, however, 
we can indeed make out the joins. The mosaic is made up of four distinct cuttings. This can be made crystal clear by manifesting the underlying IIIF code into a viewer with annotation functionality, such as Mirador. Once the image is manifested into a viewer with annotation capability, annotations of varying sizes, shapes, and colors can be added, they can be described, and then they can be saved, and then finally made visible and discoverable. My final case study is, for my current work, the most exciting. In the early years of the 21st century, scholars began to realize the potential of burgeoning digital technologies for the virtual reconstruction of dismembered manuscripts. Using a triple IF sequence, each image of the target manuscript can be manifested in an individual canvas with its individual metadata from its individual record. The images in sequence sit within a larger viewer with its own sequence level metadata, rebuilding and describing the broken codex as much as possible in a digital space. Here's how IIIF makes this work possible. Stony Brook University on Long Island serves images of their medieval manuscripts in compliance with the IIIF API. The SBU records make it very easy to find the IIIF URL and facilitate image interoperability. By copying the manifest URL and adding it to a shared Canvas viewer, users can easily mirror images and data for their own use. The process can be repeated as often as we wish, as long as we have access to the images IIIF JSON, resulting in a digital sequence in which images of related leaves can be manifested and viewed side by side. The results can be seen in my own IIIF-based resequence of 122 beads from this fragmented manuscript known as the Bovey Missile. The sequence can be found in the Fragmentarium repository. This sequence presents individual leaves in a subsequence of two images each, one of each side, each of which has its own record and its own descriptive metadata. The main sequence shown here combines all of those subsequences into a meta sequence, which has its own overarching metadata. As humans living in the haptic world, fragmentologists operate under certain constraints. Constraints of time, as we are separated from the medieval world by centuries. And constraints of space, as our objects of study may be separated from each other and us by thousands of miles. We cannot bridge the chronological divide that separates us from the original whole codex. The arrow of time only points in one direction. And we cannot bridge the spatial divide that separates each fragment from its sisters, scattered as they are across the nation, if not the globe. Entropy only runs in one direction. Working in the digital realm, however, we can bridge these divides. By leveraging digital imaging, data modeling, open access, and linked open data, we can overcome the constraints of real time and real space, allowing us to create a simulacrum of what was and can no longer be. To quote philosopher Martin Heidegger, world withdrawal and world decay can never be undone. The works are no longer the works they were. It is they themselves to be sure that we encounter there but they themselves are gone by. Thank you very much. I look forward to the discussion.